about the arrest of your mother because I know that yeah you uh -huh. played a unanticipated uh, yes role yes that that uh, my mother's arrest has been on my conscience all my life because I opened the door to her jailers uh, I was uh, I was play you know everything was precisely planned in this arrest because arrests were meant to proceed without any fuss just very smoothly nobody no loud words no cries for help um, so the, the, the state had picked out my play date, uh, a, a girl who uh, lived across the hall from us and who I had always wanted to get to know better because she was older and more sophisticated and she had never shown any interest in, in uh, being my friend. That afternoon she was there. Turned out that her father was a secret police officer and that they were living across the hall from us f to keep an eye on us. So she played her little role. She kept me busy. The doorbell rang. My mother was on the phone. Didn't, to my annoyance, you know, I had to go answer the door. Uh, four guys in workers' overalls, you know, masquerading as workers, as electricians, said, can you get your mother? She called about the meter. So I called out my mother's name and went back to my room and my play date. And about a half hour later, the apartment seemed incredibly quiet. And so I looked out and called out my mother's name and, and the apartment was silent and it was the first time I'd ever been by myself in that apartment which just uh, weeks, months before had held uh, you know, my grandparents and my parents and suddenly it was just me. Um, and, uh, and in a panic, I, I mean I just ran from room to room, no, no mama. And I couldn't believe it, that, that my mother would disappear without saying goodbye to me, without kissing me. So I went running down the stairs uh, uh, we, to the street, and there I saw my, my sister, the other girl in the picture, sitting on the curb with her bike next to her crying. And she had seen them uh, lead my, these guys in the overalls, uh, lead our mother and shove her into the back of a car and before she could get off her bike to say goodbye they drove off and uh, we didn't see our mother for almost a year after that and and it was very traumatic for me and you know as a little kid I just thought you know that I had helped the state <laughs> uh, but mostly mostly we were just we were we were in in shock because by then my father had been in prison for, for almost six months. So your mother joined your father in prison. I want to just go back to your father's experience for a second because there are a couple of things that you learned in the files about the depths to which he was brought by this experience. Mm -hmm. um, one had to do with, I think, the letter that he wrote to your mother and what he had hoped your mother would do um, to... Yes. And the other had to do with um, ending his own life. Well, that, that was probably the biggest shock, is that twice my father tried to commit suicide in prison, and in a very systematic way. It wasn't just a moment's uh, impulse. He, uh, communist prisons were very lavish in distributing sedatives, because it was in their interest to keep... In fact, it turns out from the files that their morning coffee was already laced with a, with a sedative. Uh, but uh, my father asked for uh, sleeping pills, which were given to him every morning, um, no, sorry, every evening. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the guard uh, had to watch the prisoner take the pill, you know, to assure that, that the prisoner wasn't collecting them. And my father figured out a clever way to, pre to pretend to be popping the pill, but meanwhile he was collecting them in the lining of his pocket and he had uh, something like 70 pills. Uh, he figured a hundred would do it. And then one day one of the uh, informer cellmates saw um, a bunch of these pills on the, on, the, on the floor of the cell which had dropped out of his, of his pocket when my father was, was uh, in the washroom and reported that, that my father was collecting these pills and after that he got no more pills. So in fact, one of these treacherous informers saved my father's <laughs> life thereby. But that was pretty, for me to imagine my father committing suicide in that way and you know, selfishly uh, missing my whole life, <laughs> 
my sister's life and mine and you know what became you know I mean it's a it's a terrible terrible thought for me your mother had made some arrangements for you to be taken care of by one of her friends. best friends her oldest childhood friend from her small town and uh, and I'll never forget the moment when we were led by some secret police agents in their car to this woman's uh, beautiful villa because she was married to a to a high uh, high ranking scientist and and had every means to look after us and had no children of her own and when when she opened her front door and saw these two little kids and behind us the agents and behind them their well known car and you know her the the it was the first time i'd ever seen the face of terror uh, i mean she looked absolutely stricken and she and she said in a very uh, quiver quivery voice to the to the agents uh, where should I send packages for the girls? Mm. And that was the full extent of, of her. She just, she was scared. And um, I don't remember her ever visiting us either. And um, I have to say though, David, that I stopped being judgmental about people in the, in the course of this. By the end of this research, I really understood how the terror state works and it works on fear. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if any of you saw the wonderful German film, The Lives of Others, but I, I recommend it as a, as, a, as a great depiction of how this works. It's very similar. In fact, seeing that film was another reason I wanted to get at our I files. That, yeah. I, I just thought, wow, this is so familiar, this, the, the mood and the, you know, the neighbor who's, who's uh, afraid the neighbor to report. across the hall. Who, yes. Yeah. Yes, because of course our neighbors were all, I mean none of our, our, our neighbors ever visited us, my sister and me, when, when we were, you know, political orphans. As political orphans you were taken in by a family that was being paid to take care of you. Uh, I get yeah. the impression from the book that they were decent people. They were, yeah. They were, they but, were, but they weren't my parents. You must have been terribly lonely then. In the, yeah, in, yeah, and it was, it was. Uh, we 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 lived in 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 a in a very lively neighborhood of Budapest, and this was on the outskirts, and everything about it was creepy and strange, and um, you know we had left everything from our dog to our toys to, yeah, it was it was total dislocation, um, and and. Um, uh, it's very hard to explain to people who haven't been through something like this, including to my own children. When I, when I tell these stories, and now you know, they've read the book, um, that uh, this is how a large segment of humanity lived for, for a half a century. You know, we were, we were just one among thousands. Uh, our case was unusual in that, uh, in that we weren't just ordinary people, we were enemies, enemies of the people because my parents had so overtly signed on with the enemy, the United States. Yeah. And I have, to, I have to say that just now uh, watching the um, Statue of Liberty from here, wow, <laughs> <laughs> this is a powerful uh, statement. And, and, you know, when, when I see that statue, I remember the first time I saw that statue. And it's, uh, you, never, you never forget uh, how, how fortunate you are once you've, once you've known how different life can be. You just never get over that, that sense of, wow, am I lucky <laughs> we got out. <laughs>